done to bring me happy With great pleasure, I'd like to welcome you to a captain's log. I'm your host, Lily Fox Lim, joined by the lovable, laughable, and animated android always zigging before he zags, Raj. Yes, thank you for the introduction, Lily. I'm always doing things in the wrong orderly fashion. Oh, but for this brief moment, I'm your co-host. Wow, so formal addressing me by rank. It's an honorary rank, indeed, as we're passing the pleasures of Star Trek onto our fans in this fictional world of our talk show for the formidably intelligent worlds of Star Trek. Speaking of honorary ranks, our ambassador to the fans, Brian, is due to being back on board from a conference in the Badlands just about now. The Badlands! We haven't heard about that region of space full of plasma storms and gravitational anomalies since Deep Space Nine! Well, yes, you're spot on, my spunky little circuits of certainty creature. Since the demilitarized zone disbanded in Deep Space Nine, a new one is provisionally being set up in the Badlands. And our upcoming guest, played by Captain Sanders from the Excelsior Class Federation starship USS Malinche, actually patrolled that first demilitarized zone to assist Captain Benjamin Sisko during the McKee conflicts. We're going to be interviewing the amazing Star Trek actor of five different incredible roles in Star Trek, Eric Pierpoint. He's our special guest in a matter of moments. Well, Ambassador better return to the ship soon or I'll have to help you interview this amazing actor who was an ambassador himself in the real Star Trek world of the next generation as an Iran alien named Vovol. Volval was assigned to understand human emotions from Patrick Stewart's Captain Picard. He also played the Klingon Kortar in Voyager's Barge of the Dead episode, which was probably your favorite role of his, Lily. Pierpoint also appeared opposite Scott Bakula in Enterprise as the Eska hunter named Sherat. But he's probably most well known by two Star Trek roles. The role you just mentioned, Captain Sanders, and my favorite as Harris, the Section 31 operative from four episodes of Star Trek Enterprise. Oh. Hey. hey. <laughs> Hi, Lily. Hi. Precisely four minutes late for the show. Mm -hmm. I hope I didn't miss much, but I did miss my two favorite Trekkers. Hi, Lily. <laughs> Welcome back aboard, BK. Yes. I see you weren't badgered or bruised up too much in the Badlands. Uh, it wasn't too bad, but thank you, Lily. Now, glad to be back in one piece, actually, because after that intense transporter beam breaking me apart for a moment with all the plasma storms there, wow. all was quiet on the Western Front, or at least of that quadrant. Mm -hmm. Now, the new demilitarized zone is very beneficial to our negotiating peaceful coexistence, which is one thing I truly love about the Star Trek and Federation. Me too. Yes! Yes! Really, thank you for opening the show as a host. Well, yeah, it was fun being uh, in the proverbial center seat, you know, being in command of the show. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. There's so much to tell you while you're off the ship. Eric has been an actor in so many productions, like Hot Pursuit on NBC in 1984, for example. So many Eric-esque roles, even before his work on Star Trek. Roz, thank you for that archaic yet fanboy nostalgia that you're capable of pulling out of your 80s archives. Catch you in the holodeck later, I'm sure. View screen off. The Captain's Log returns in a moment. Welcome back to A Captain's Log. Lily is by my side, taking you along for a ride into four different Star Trek series and five roles with Eric Pierpoint, who's our guest here on A Captain's Log. Yes, Eric, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot. Glad to be here. Eric, I know Lily and I distinctly remember seeing you on screen more times than we can count. Now, we're going to try to cover all the Star Trek roles that you appeared in, as well as the Alienation TV series you did in this half hour. Now, let's start with you as an actor. Can you tell us a quick history of how you kicked off your career in acting being born here in California? 
Yeah, uh, first of all, there's more roles than I can count, too. So anyway, uh, way back when, I was born in Redlands, California, but raised in Washington, D.C. And I went back uh, to California, to Redlands, to the University of Redlands. And when I was a senior there, uh, I took my first acting class. And I remember walking out on stage. I uh, did a couple of plays there, and, and I thought, oh, this really feels like home. This is where, what I should be doing. So I did the normal thing, which was back in those days, take all the money I had and hitchhike my way through Europe, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, places, headed back to D.C. Uh, and wait, you know, trying to find a job. I ended up giving guided tours at the Lincoln Memorial from at the five to midnight shift, dressed in a smoky bear hat. But I thought, you know what? I'm going to reconnect. So I decided to go back to grad school, study classical theater, ended up with an MFA at Catholic University in D.C. Uh, and so I, uh, I started my career in Washington, D.C. I was on stage a lot uh, doing plays. I also managed a, a bar and a restaurant on Capitol Hill all at the same time. I don't know how I did it, but... Uh, when you dream big, you do amazing things. I could never do all that right now. Anyway, I ended up moving up uh, to New York, where I started my so-called legit acting career. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I still remember to this day the commercial. Now, there's a very interesting role in the final season seven of Next Generation, where you first appear in Star Trek. You played the alien ambassador Vival in the early season episode Liaisons. Now, your character poses as a shuttle pod pilot to transfer Picard to a conference, but your character's ulterior motive is to study Picard and his human emotions on love while masquerading as a woman. You switch back to your male actual self after deceiving Picard. That's so cool. What was this experience like playing the role of deception? And was there really a precipice or cliff of sorts, or was it on the Paramount soundstage? I'll answer the, that the last part of that question first, I guess, because the first part is kind of fun. Uh, yeah, I think it was a sound stage, and I remember there was uh, uh, you had to walk up a couple of areas that they had constructed there, and of course they had it all lit and I'm sure green or blue screen in the background where they uh, you know they did all the CGI effects and uh, made it look like I was going to jump down the Grand Canyon or something. <laughs> Uh, it was really cool the way it ended up, um, but I just remember walking up there and, uh, you know, standing at what should be this thousand foot drop or something. But getting the role was interesting. Okay, well, he was the uh, ambassador of love from the planet Iaria, I believe. And when I first read the script, and I read for it, I you know, and I read for all kinds of things in Star Trek, and we'll get into that later, I guess. But um, uh, I remember reading it, and I went, oh, boy, do they know that if they dress me up as a woman, this thing is never going to work? Because <laughs> I just make a really bad-looking woman. Well, fortunately, they hired Barbara Williams uh, to play me, and... Uh, I've been dying to meet her, uh, my other part of myself. I haven't seen her for many, many years. So I found it, you know, I, I, I love Star Trek for the imaginations that they have. I believe the other ambassadors were um, conflict or pleasure, uh, and they had their stories. There were three of us. Um, but with um, Picard and relating to... Um, that story and him as an actor he's a, such a terrific fellow you know a great gentleman very generous um i remember it as a, a lot of fun Eric, executive producer ira stephen bear knew you very well from your days as a regular cast member on the early 1980s tv series fame now he wanted to bring you back multiple times for your role as captain sanders in star trek deep space nine as he said in his companion book this role for you, though, wasn't the first time you were thought of as a captain in Star Trek. We had a good time at Fame. Uh, I was there on that show for the last <clears throat> final season as a drama teacher, played the role of a drama teacher, and um, remember him fondly. Um, yeah, uh, 
I was, uh, I auditioned for, actually for Next Generation, I think it was um, the Riker role. Uh, but then it got very close uh, to, you know, possibly playing the captain's role. Uh, but Avery, Brook, Avery Brooks uh, took that part. Uh, but I, I read for that. And also uh, the next one uh, with Kate Mulgrew, uh, there was a situation where they, they'd hired a, an actress um, to play the captain. Something fell out. And there was a, a gap there where I, once again, got pulled in to audition for the role of the captain. Uh, and finally getting Captain Sanders, I, I would have loved to have come back as, as Captain Sanders. You know, because I've been in makeup a lot in science fiction. Uh, when you are playing the the ultimate role as a you know commander, captain, uh, it it's a almost a different set of actor muscles that you're using, and that would have been really great to explore. Um, there's a sort of responsibility built-in responsibility. Uh, actors who are captains and you have to be able to believe that they can command all of this that they can make these quick decisions uh, that there's a maybe a, a some sort of personal charm or sense of humor that they have uh, that you that you look forward to when you're looking at the lead of a show and um, so I um, you know, I enjoyed that show. I've, I've been watching some of these episodes recently. And um, that one was um, particularly interesting to, to step up, but also going through a failure of sorts of not being able to accomplish my mission of getting um, stopped by Eddington. And... Um, so I, personally, I wanted to get back on the show and go get him, but he'd already got got. But <clears throat> it would be another lifetime. Maybe I'll come back as a captain um, and uh, and have my own ship. That'd be great. Oh, be careful what you wish for, Eric. You might get it. You know, with all the Star Trek, all the alternate realities and mirror universes, you could possibly show up as Captain Sanders again. <laughs> Falling in the cavalry, you know, here yes. it comes. Captain Sanders. <laughs> yes. Eric, please talk about one of the most popular Star Trek Voyager episodes that you appeared in, titled Barge of the Dead, where you played the Klingon Kortar. How did this fierce first ever Klingon destined for the afterlife of Dishonored in Grathor, who took Balana Taurus's mother to Stovacor, come about? Can you share about your audition and some tidbits about the role? When you're auditioning for an alien, it I believe it helps to have a a good classical background, theater background, because oftentimes you are, you don't want to sound like you're, you know, some, somebody with a Southern accent or something showing up and you're playing a Klingon. This doesn't, for me, that doesn't work. Right. Uh, so there has to be a certain formality, a certain depth and um, uh, something about the essence of these, especially these larger than life, cling on folklore characters and and with him it was a huge deal in playing a Klingon who was so attached to mythology so I I felt I had to play Korta again the responsibility of of being on the barge of the dead and being the captain of that and the all of the all you know the Klingon history I would I would have loved to have also come back and done that a few times, you know. But I had a, a kind of a funny experience where I had shot all Friday night and I went on a plane the next day to go to the East Coast to do a sci-fi convention. I had to show up, I believe, at 2.45 a.m. Monday morning to get put into Klingon makeup uh, to shoot. Okay. Uh, the plane was late. We got into LAX. I didn't even have time to come to my house. I went straight from the airport to the chair at Paramount and they put me in makeup and then because it was the final day of shooting for that particular episode and they were bringing the next episode in right away they had to shoot twice as much material as they had 
originally planned probably, and it took 24 hours. Oh so 24 hours later and rocking like this on a poor man process on the barge of the debt, you know, with a wheel and doing these great scenes, you know, you know, such heavyweight scenes. And then driving home on the 101 freeway in L.A., I got pulled over by the police at 3, 3.30 or something like that. And he got me off of the freeway onto an exit, onto a street, and he walked up and he, he said, uh, I pulled you over for weaving. Have you been drinking? And I said, no, I've been a Klingon. <laughs> and I, so he gave me this like, Okay, follow my finger. You know, I'm, I'm looking back and forth, and I still have pieces of makeup like stuck because I wanted to get out of there and just go home. You know, I had this black T-shirt on that they always give you, and there's makeup crap all over that. Then there's my script, and so the guy just started laughing, and he, he said, "Well, you think you can find your way home to your planet?" And I said, "Yeah, I think I can." Do this and so, well, I can't give you a ticket for driving about Klingon, and I said, "Well, I appreciate that." So anyway, uh, that's how that ended up. <laughs> oh my gosh, Eric being pulled over for too much swerving after shooting Barge of the Dead and wearing <laughs> Klingon makeup that's impeding your vision. Now that's a story you and the officer will both remember for the rest of your lives. For sure. We too will remember that story behind this episode and your character, Qatar, forever. Thanks for sharing that, Eric. The poor cop is like, I've seen everything now. Okay. <laughs> now, I can imagine the extensive makeup you had to have applied was very different in this Star Trek role as a Klingon. So having to spend hours getting into makeup and the costume on Voyager so early. Let me ask you this question, Eric. Are you a early morning person? You have to be a morning person in this business because you, most of the time you're going to start early, you know. Uh it would be great if everybody could have a call time of nine o'clock a.m. and you got out at five. Okay, so now you're in Enterprise. This makes four consecutive Star Trek series that you've appeared in. Uh, first, discuss on the Eska Hunter character named Sherat, please, and then tell us about your recurring role as the Section Thirty One character Harris and trying to recruit Malcolm Reed. I, I assume you knew that this would be a recurring role. I'll get to Harris in a second. I'll just briefly fly by uh, Sherat um, hunting intelligent game. Uh, on the dark planet, the uh, rogue planet, I think it was. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that that was that was really interesting. It reminded me of maybe something from the Twilight Zone. It gives you pause about you know what's intelligent, what's not intelligent, and why are they there? And I'm not a hunter. Uh, I like leaving the animals. I like my animals in cellophane, and I cook them. I say, you know, <laughs> don't get any pleasure out of hunting. As far as that goes, it's always kind of cool to to see how they work that theme out of hunting intelligent game like that. The Harris character was interesting in that I had no idea what I was getting into. And it started actually in the audition process. I didn't audition for Harris. I believe that that day I was going in to read for another Klingon. So I read for him. One of the producers said, would, you, would I mind looking at this other script, these other scenes, sides as we call them, uh, for a second and coming back in? I had no idea what it was. So I did, I looked it over and I thought, okay, he's human. Um, all right, let's um, see where this hat, where this fits in. So I got a sense of him, got back in, read for him, got the part. And as I'm going to the first day of shooting, I'm thinking, okay, section 31, what, what is that? And there was a sort of a security guy who was near the set. I'm shaking my head. I'm going through this and, you know, getting my act together. And so he said, oh, Section 31. I said, well, you tell me about that. So here I am talking to security, you know, on the set of Star Trek. And he's telling me his thoughts on Section 31. I said, and I knew something of it, but he kind of filled in some some cracks. Uh, but here's a character who is is seems like there's always something else going on in his head, yeah. you know, like he says one thing, but there's like 
three or four or five different things down the road that he's thinking of. Right, right. And so in a sense, when you first meet him, he's, uh, okay, what what's going on? Is this guy completely evil? Or is he just trying to do his job? Uh, what, you know, what kind of, you know, sort of projecting a sense of authority but openness and trying to manipulate. Um, I mean, th that always makes for good stuff. Eric, there's an incredibly successful Star Trek series, Star Trek Discovery, that had story arcs with Section 31, which we believe here on our talk show has opened doors for Michelle Yeoh's character to star in a new spin-off series. And now to date, besides her character, Philippa Giorgio, your character, Harris, in Enterprise, is the most prominent Section 31 operative ever in Star Trek. So it's well within the age range of your early years as Harris. Would you consider reprising that role in a prequel style setting? I'd be willing to come back and, uh, you know, give it another shot. Just let me know what, you know, give me the script. Let me know. OK. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do like the fact that he's a bit inscrutable. You know, it, it's just. Um, it's just enough there. Uh, to kind of have, you know, send someone off to do his bidding and um, or find a cure for the plague in one you know, so um, I enjoy doing Harris a lot. Now, out of the five very different roles you portrayed in the four Star Trek series you appeared in, what character would you like to see yourself in again as a actor and extending the legacy of that character? Ooh. You know, I think Lily and I know the two characters you've already alluded to. Well, you're talking about Sanders or Harris uh, as either one. You know, you tee up, as we say. I'm, I don't play a lot of golf. But anyway, <laughs> you know, you Either one would be a pleasure to do going forward. Um, the the other ones, the only other one that would be great to do as a recurring role would be Kortar. You know, uh, if but how many opportunities would there ever be to go back and play that character on the barge of the dead? You know, I mean, how, there's only so many plots that you could probably come up with, and I think one is probably enough. Um, Otherwise, you know, but so he's not in a date. He is not a, a regular type of uh, character as written. Um, Harris, uh, you can inject as not a regular character, but he would be a recurring character, uh, I believe, because, you're, you know, you're not going to have him in every show unless the show specifically is about Section 31 or so tied into it that he's. He's there doing something more, more or less. I, I would think that that he or whoever would be uh, in Section 31 would be uh, showing up as a recurring character, uh, just to remind you of where all this stuff is coming from. Uh, but Sanders uh, has would have the most potential to be a lead character because if you've got a starship. Um, okay, that's your adventure now. Um, you are literally the captain of the stars. Eric, that's a great response, and I would agree. It's a toss-up between the Cleon, the captain, Sanders, and Harris in Section 31. Trekkies, BK and I will be back to discuss more with Eric Pierpoint coming up. A captain's log returns in a moment. Welcome back to A Captain's Log. Brian and I are joined this week by actor Eric Pierpoint. Check out these facts about Eric. Check them out. Not too long ago, we had the great Gary Graham as a guest here on our show, and we talked to him about the storytelling of the wardrobe to keep the leather jacket as he knew he would return alongside you and your detective character, George Francisco. Tell us about what it was like working atop the cast on the Alienation series with Gary Graham, putting on the makeup as an alien for 22 episodes, and your reaction to Fox Network canceling your show after such a successful first season. 
Alien Nation uh, is part of me wants to come back in the future as George Francisco and have that family. We were really tight. Uh, Ken Johnson was the producer, creator of the series and the, the TV movies. And we're friends to this day. And we've talked recently, and I've watched a number of episodes. I had a chemistry with Gary. I think that we were very supportive of each other, uh, very tuned into each other. And we, I think when you inhabit these characters so deeply, uh, the give and take that we could do ad lib or whatever during the course of the scenes, or just the humanity of it. Um, I think that we went out of our way to be able to work off of each other. Uh, he was great to work off of because he was very generous as an actor. And it, you know, it just was, aside from me being pissed off that he never had to be in serious makeup, um, <laughs> This wasn't fair. <laughs> <laughs> when we found out that we weren't uh, going to be picked up after a year, it was shocking. Uh, I remember getting ready to go to the airport, and I, the phone rang, and Ken Johnson was on the phone, and he said, uh, hey, are you sitting down? Well, we didn't get picked up. I thought, how is this possible? That's insane that we didn't get picked up. Uh I was really stunned. I, I just, you know, was so committed to the project. You know, I was too, Eric, as were many Alienation fans. You deserve better for your Emmy Award winning series. But Eric, you did reprise the role in the Alienation films. Now, really quick, did you and Gary Graham have very different call times considering your character, George Francisco, always had to be in alien makeup? I remember Gary Graham and I, you know, I would always kind of like shake my head and go, because he'd bounce in at six o'clock in the morning. He'd look in the mirror, and that was it for him. You know, and I'd been there for a couple of hours, and it was me. You know, whatever. And he used to say, "Wait till you, wait till it happens to you." Well, well uh, it did, but he only got ears, I think. You know, for <laughs> exactly. Well, kind of bastard. Hey, that's nothing. Come on, give him something else. Like take away his eye or something, and put something else. Eric Pierpoint, it has been a tremendous half hour taking the time to delve into your career and your stories. Thank you so much. It's been a good time with you too. Hello, happy, my old friend. I'm glad you've manifested.